idea that China is going to end up like a Western-style society is a nonsense. China will remain China. Now, there is a view in Hong Kong that Hong Kong did well uh, in the period before 1997 because it was smart, because it was clever, because it was free, because it could get on with it, because it was with the British and so on. Now, I think that for the great part, this is a, a serious misinterpretation of history. Hong Kong did well between 19, the late 1970s and the handover in 1997 because it got lucky. What do I mean by that? It got lucky because China in 1978 started to open up bit by bit, step by step. It didn't open up fully until after the WTO agreement in 2001. So while it was still opening up in a piecemeal fashion, Hong Kong could take on some of the functions that otherwise China would have done. It would have liked the front office in some senses for, uh, for China. And so Hong Kong was the beneficiary of being able to do these things. One of these things, of course, was that if you were a Western firm, a European firm, an American firm, a Japanese firm, a Korean firm, and you wanted access to the Chinese market, the easiest stopping point, initially, was to do it from Hong Kong. So it wasn't that they were very smart, it was that they got lucky. They got lucky not because of the British, they got lucky because of China and the role that China was performing. Now, of course, after WTO, uh, then China increasingly, I mean, if you wanted to open up in the Chinese market, you know, why would you go to Hong Kong? It became irrelevant. If you want to open up in the Chinese market, go to Shanghai or go to Beijing or go to Guangzhou or go to Shenzhen, wherever you wanted to go. But not, you wouldn't, by and large, choose to stay in Hong Kong. So the raison d'etre, the cause of Hong Kong's relative success in that period, disappeared and Hong Kong had to find a new role in the period after 1997. So it wasn't China's fault that this happened. This was a change of circumstances in the relationship between China and Hong Kong. Now, another reason that the period since 1997 has been criticized, particularly by the British, you say the, governor, the former governor of Hong Kong, Chris Patton, would say, you know, China's not been true, to democracy and so on. Now this, in my view, this is British hypocrisy. Britain ran Hong Kong for 155 years. And I'll tell you something, there was never a semblance of democracy. Did they ever introduce universal suffrage? Did they ever talk about universal suffrage? Not a word of it, until after the handover agreement and then with Chinese rule looming, then it became essential that Hong Kong uh, was uh, was democratic in a in a Western style fashion. This was this is this, this was hypocrisy. How should Hong Kong try and proceed now? Now I think a word of criticism here of the Chinese government and its handling uh, of Hong Kong. I think that one country, two systems, which was a brilliant, brilliant solution to the problem of Hong Kong a civilization state solution to the problem. A nation state would never think of those terms in those terms. But what is one country, two systems? How do you create the balance between the two? The project in the longer run is clearly to create a more unified country. It's not to just keep the two places entirely separate. And I think one of the difficulties that um, China has had is that initially, its reaction to the handover. Remember, this is 1997. This is China just turning outwards into the world. Um, there was a lot of publicity questioning about how China would conduct itself um, as the as the uh, as, as, as the the force behind Hong Kong uh, and so on. And so I think that China's natural instinct in that period, an understandable instinct 
was to emphasize two systems. I mean, I remember when I, I lived in Hong Kong soon, for two and a half years, soon after the handover, and I remember you know, being surprised that the only evidence, virtually, of any Chinese presence, visible presence in Hong Kong, was a Chinese, one Chinese flag flying over one of the buildings near the harbor. There was just no evidence. Essentially, there was not much change. It just carried on in the old form. And there were two big problems with this. One, the governance of Hong Kong is a colonial governance. It's set up in a colonial manner. It's a kind of executive. There's no political leadership. There's no political sense of direction set by a colonial administration because that's not the job of a colonial administration. That would have been done back in London in those days. But basically the form of government has stayed more or less the same as it was previously. And the second problem is about the economy. Now, contrary to the way in which the British have historically liked to talk about Hong Kong as this dynamic, competitive economy, by and large, that is just rubbish. Hong Kong is a typical colonial economy. It is not a competitive economy. It's a monopolistic economy. It basically preferred or empowered the tycoons to run Hong Kong, to divide up the spoils between themselves, above all in the field of property where most of the money was made. So this is, this is a, a, an oligopolistic and monopolistic economy. That had to be changed. That has to be changed. But unfortunately, not nearly enough change has taken place. So my criticism of, uh, of the Chinese government, it needs to break the situation in Hong Kong, to put, allow Hong Kong to go forward. It needs to change those two situations, to have a different sort of administration and to have a different kind of economy, which is more open. Now, let me finish by saying, compare the fortunes of Hong Kong with Shenzhen. Deng Xiaoping deliberately suggested the idea of Shenzhen just over the border, a little fishing port, so it was close to Hong Kong and could model itself and learn some of Hong Kong's lessons. Now compare the situation of Hong Kong today with where Shenzhen today. Shenzhen has made absolutely electrifying progress. It is the technological center probably of China. It is the second only to Silicon Valley in its technical competence and innovation. And Hong Kong? There's nothing like that in Hong Kong. Hong Kong has got, uh, Hong Kong has made zero, they talked about it, but it made zero progress in this direction. I think that the, the Hong Kong people should press the Chinese government for more rapid integration in China's own plans. That, so that Ch Hong Kong, rather than just thinking of itself as apart from China, it needs to think of itself more in terms of being part of China. You know, the mentality of the people is, um, we're different, we're not Chinese. Well, of course, for 155 years, they, they never learned anything about China. They speak Cantonese, sure, but they didn't know anything really about China. They were ignorant about the North. They, you know, their lines of, of vision were all westwards to Britain or the West or the United States later or Canada, etc., and never North to China.